Theistic evolution is unfortunately a terrible label, isn't it? I mean, who would want to be a theistic evolutionist? I mean, it really sounds awful. Most people aren't quite sure what a theist is. And when you say theistic evolution, the noun is evolution. That's what really matters, right? And theistic is this sort of throwaway adjective like, uh, well, okay, maybe that part isn't nearly as important. I think we got a problem here with our description of this. At least I feel uh, from my perspective, if this is the harmony we're seeking, couldn't we give it a more attractive label? So I modestly propose here a, 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 a label that I think says the same thing and it hasn't already been contaminated by being used in some other way. So many of our words are already like off the table because you can't say creation and you can't say intelligence and you probably can't say design and maybe we should call this crevolution. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so instead, what are we talking about here? We're talking about life, bios, but life that comes into being because of God, because of the word, logos. So this is bios through logos, or maybe simply biologos. God speaking us into being. Now this sounds a little meta metaphysical, but I like the way this sort of comes together then, because then we've got DNA, this wonderful language. And here's where the language of God comes about. God in his amazing mind, coming up with the plan for life, including each of us, creatures that would have the moral law, in whom he would infuse an eternal soul at the time of the Garden of Eden, in whom he would give the ability to seek him, in whom he would give free will, free will that we would choose to disobey him and making us fallen creatures. But speaking all of that into us uh, through this amazing process of evolution using the molecule of DNA, the language of God. We're all walking around with three billion letters of it. So let me conclude, because I've run a little later than I was supposed to, uh, and I still want to have questions, but I gather we've got a little breathing room here, just with an exhortation, because I think this is a, an appropriate group uh, to, to think about this. This is a critical time, it seems to me, for Christians and for our whole society. If we take the tack of trying to fight against conclusions from science that are pretty unmistakable, we run the risk of appearing to be sort of out of step with the, with the modern time and to appear to be intellectually uh, not completely honest. We can't allow ourselves, it seems to me, to say, well, God put the data in there to fool us. That just doesn't seem like a tenable position when you're trying to promote the idea of a loving God. So I think instead we should follow this exhortation from a little more than 100 years ago from Benjamin Warfield He's really a remarkable theologian uh, who, very much uh, seeing the world rocked a bit by Darwin at that point, uh, wrote these words, and I think this ought to be a good motto for all the members of ASA. We must not then, as Christians, assume an attitude of antagonism toward the truths of reason or the truths of philosophy or the truths of science or the truths of history or the truths of criticism. As children of the light, isn't that what we are? We must be careful to keep ourselves open to every ray of light. Let us then cultivate an attitude of courage as over against the investigations of the day. None should be more zealous in them than we. None should be more quick to discern truth in every field, more hospitable to receive it, more loyal to follow it, whithersoever it leads. I think that's a wonderful way uh, for us to face up uh, to all of the observations and discoveries that God has given us the ability to make and to realize that as we make them, we are in greater, not less, awe of God Almighty, and that he has given us a chance uh, to discover the majesty of his creation and in that process uh, to worship him. And that is the theme of this book that I tried uh, to put together over the last year in which I hope will now at least start some discussions amongst those who have been basically sold uh, a message that science and faith are locked in combat and that there will be no prisoners taken, and that ultimately one or the other is going to win. That seems to me is a terribly sad uh, and unnecessary pers prospect. The stage has been dominated too long by the extreme voices coming from atheist scientists on one end and fundamentalists on the other who demand that uh, science has to conform itself uh, to narrow readings of particular scriptures. And I think if we as scientists uh, could get together and speak perhaps a bit 
more, for, uh, more openly than we have on this topic, uh, we could help a lot because there's a lot of us. And I think uh, in, in many ways, uh, we are the best hope uh, that this battle has of being put to an end. We started this battle, we humans did. Only humans can end it. It's not God's battle, it's ours. But if we are loving of each other and serious followers of him, I think we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate this delightful lecture and we appreciate the time commitment you've made to join us and enlighten us. And uh, we are very grateful for your insights on this. Do you believe that evolution is the greatest impediment to bringing scientists to Christianity? Or do you think it is indeed the agnosticism that you talked about where they just don't take the time to sort it out as you did in your own testimony? I think it's all of the above, and I think it's different for each scientist uh, who's not become a believer, and that's why we have to get to know uh, our colleagues a little better in this regard and not be afraid uh, to engage in those conversations. I think a lot of scientists' uh, resistance is sort of because of the profession that we all carry out, which is to focus on uh, the rigorous demonstration of facts uh, using data and the idea of changing that mindset to think outside of scientific questions into spiritual questions makes many scientists just downright uncomfortable and they don't want to go there. <laughs> but there is also, I think, this genuine issue of just being too busy, uh, feeling slightly like, oh, I'm not sure I really want to think about that. I'll put it off until someday when I really need uh, to make a decision. And there again, I think we can be helpful to those people to help them realize that they're really missing out. It's not as if uh, they're, there's something to be afraid of. There's something to be afraid you're missing. So I, I, every person's a little different. Yes, Jim. Well, again, thank you. Uh, your words, as always, were lucid and insightful. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, evolution is elegant. Let's use that description. Yes. Uh, but it's not always beautiful. It embodies a great deal of struggle and pain. Uh, what does it say about God's priorities and character to choose a method of creation that requires so much suffering? So that's a great question, and I know it does trouble a lot of people uh, to contemplate uh, this whole business of natural selection. Uh, why would God do it that way instead of, you know, bringing uh, some happy, healthy creatures immediately into being? And I don't have an easy answer to that. I don't have an easy answer to many of these questions. I do think when we look around us, uh, we can certainly recognize the fact that in our own lives, it is not necessarily God's intention for us to have a completely happy, uh, unstormy experience. Uh, and suffering seems to be part of our life. We don't seem to live in a garden of delight. We live in a veil of tears. And why is that? Uh, you can ask it on an evolutionary scale, or you can ask it in each of our own lives and of those we see around us. And I think the bottom line, although it's not necessarily an easy one, and theologians uh, who have thought a lot more about this, uh, and especially I think of Lewis and his book called The Problem of Pain, uh, would say that God's purposes are not necessarily for us to go along smoothly uh, without some sort of challenge and even suffering. And I think that's been true uh, ever since life got started. For us in particular, God's purposes are to try to help us find him. And we rarely seem to do a lot of that when things are going well. But when we hit a rough spot, as Lewis says, uh, God shouts uh, in our troubles, even though he whispers when things are going well. It's, he shouts, it's his megaphone uh, to rouse a deaf world. And if that's true of us uh, today, then why would it be surprising uh, that the evolutionary process would carry with that as well? We may desire to think of uh, a, uh, a, a kind of creation uh, where there was never any suffering by anyone. It doesn't happen to be the world that we see around us or that has been there uh, all along.